Lord, thank you guys. <clears throat> so this week, I lost my voice on Monday and Tuesday, and I was preparing my message, praying, God, please give me some voice so that I can share what you have in my heart. And thankfully, I'm able to speak, so don't mind the raspiness. My voice is still recovering. It's much better than yesterday. So, you know, humidifier works, drinking tea and water works, and your prayers work, so thank you. So please bear with me uh, as I, <clears throat> bear with my voice as we, as we learn about gospel generosity today. We're starting a new series. It's entitled Gospel Generosity. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at the three gifts that God has given human beings. He's given us all the gift of time. He's given us treasure. And then he's given us talent. So time, treasure, and talent. And what we're going to do today is we're going to discover uh, what, what do we do with the gift of time that God has given us. So uh, we're going we're gonna to have a little bit of a conversation here. Turn to your neighbor and share with your neighbor what's, what are some things that you uh, enjoy doing with your time this week. All right, I'll give you uh, 23 seconds. Go. Go. All right, <clears throat> 15 seconds left, 15. All right, five, four, three, two, one. All right, did you enjoy hearing what your neighbor had to share? Now, if you would be authentic and honest, now share something that you wish you didn't spend your time on last this past week. Okay, with your neighbor, right? I'll give you 19 seconds, okay? Go. Cool. Something that you wish you didn't spend your time doing or you wasted your time doing too much. <clears throat> All right, five more seconds. Those of you watching online, Talk with your neighbor or think about it yourself. All right, <clears throat> so let's be, let's be honest, right? What is one way that you regret spending your time this past week? What did your neighbor say if you're too ashamed to talk about your own? Too much, too much time on Netflix? Anyone? Yeah, some, some people are, are too much time driving, yeah. Too much time making a decision. What'd you say? Yeah, too much time watching the elections, especially this past week, all right? So check this out. Everyone has, when it comes to time, treasure, and talent, uh, everyone has different talents, right? <clears throat> everyone has uh, different treasures. Everyone has different uh, treasures in their bank account. No one is the same. But all of us have time. The equal, it, it's, all of us have an equal amount of time, okay? Time is the only equitable gift. It's the only gift we have. What is time anyway? Do, do you have a definition of time? What, what is time? Are we experiencing time right now? So let me give you the, the, the dictionary uh, philosophical definition. The indefinite continued progress of existence in events in the past, present, and future regarded as a whole. Ooh, okay. <clears throat> so what does that mean? So time is basically uh, a way that we experience existence that has a past, a present, which we have right now, and a future. Okay? All right, that sounds, that sounds that's too philosophical. Let's bring it down, let's bring it down to earth. Uh, time is... Uh, we have a, a specific duration. I, I was looking up some statistics, wondering how, how, uh, what's the average lifespan of human beings in the world? <clears throat> in the U.S., it's, a, almost, it's closer to 80, but in the world, do you know how long the average lifespan is of a human being? <clears throat> what do you think? It's 73 years, okay? 73 years. Those of you who are uh, who have, have beat 73, God bless you. Um, you, God has, you have taken care of yourself and awesome. 
but the average lifespan is 73 years. I'm, I'm past the halfway mark already, <clears throat> all right? So time, what we do know is time is limited. And Solomon said this in Ecclesiastes 7, verse 2. He said, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. You see what he's saying? It's actually better to go to a funeral than to a wedding. Why is that? Solomon, why are you saying it's better to go to the house of mourning to a funeral than to the house of feasting, like at a wedding? Because when you go to a funeral, we all lay it to heart that life doesn't last forever, that it's going to end. And we all know <clears throat> that time, the time is, 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 is short. The older that I get, the older I get, I realize, wow, I'm, I, I can't believe, I'm, I'm, my kids are going to become teenagers in a few years, well, in a few years, give me five, six, seven years, they're going to be teen. they're going to grow up and wow, it's, it passes by so fast. And so the question is, when we, when we know that time is so short, how are we supposed to spend our time, okay? How are we supposed to spend our time? Look, uh, <clears throat> Christianity, the Bible, it doesn't prescribe or give a prescription of exactly what you should do once you wake up until you sleep at nighttime. <clears throat> it's not gonna give you a formula, okay? Um, let me pull my planner out here. So, I don't know if there's anyone who, who, who loves, like, I'm a prod productivity junkie, right? I've bought so many different planners, used so many different calendars, studied so many different systems. You can go to Barnes and Noble and, and find so many different systems, right? I have a system now where I, I journal on the left side every day in my devotional time, and I write down what's most important. Everyone has their own system on how to manage, how to manage their time. The Bible is not gonna give you, hey, this is, what, this is exactly what you need to do, okay? It's not gonna tell you uh, you need, this is what you're gonna do at 6, 6 a.m. and at 8 a.m. and at 2 p.m. It's just not gonna tell you that. The Bible doesn't give you a prescription, however, on the, it gives you a philosophy of how we should use our time. It doesn't give you a prescription, a formula, it gives you a philosophy, a what? <clears throat> a philosophy, okay? And what we're gonna do this morning is unpack a scriptural teaching of a biblical philosophy on how we can manage and use our time. You guys still with me? All right. So we're gonna go to Luke chapter 10, okay? And we're just gonna read. We're gonna be in verses 38 through 42, just five verses. <clears throat> and what we're gonna do today is we're gonna figure out, we're gonna learn two philosophies of time, of time use. Two philosophies of time use, okay? So here's the first one. Let's start with uh, <clears throat> verse 38. So if you have a physical Bible, that's great. If you have a digital Bible, that's okay. Let's go. Luke chapter 10, now in 38. Now as they went on their way. This is Jesus and his disciples, okay? Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. <clears throat> All right, keep going. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. Look at verse 40. But Martha was, what, ver what word does your Bible say? My version says distracted. Martha was distracted with what? With Netflix? Martha was distracted with much serving, okay? And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me, all right? Martha is distracted by doing, all right? So I'm gonna write it on here. Uh, I'm gonna write it big because I know those in the back, you need like a magnifying glass, but we're gonna write it here. So she was distracted by, what word is this? <clears throat> All right, she was distracted by the philosophy of do, 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 serve, 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 serve. Come on, Jesus. I, look, I, I'm preparing the food. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting all the dishes. Uh, I'm making sure that things are, are spick and span and things are clean. Uh, Jesus, come on, tell Mary to wake up. 
I need help because I have to do, 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 do. I have to serve, 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 serve. She's distracted by doing. And just in case you think that you, that we are immune to distraction, the distraction of doing, let's think again. Uh, the other day, uh, Catherine, was in, Catherine was in Colorado for a few days, and I was with my, my, my girls. We had a grand time. <clears throat> one day, one of my daughters, Eliana, she was a little sad, and she shared this, she shared this uh, line with me while we were talking. <clears throat> Uh, and I said, why are you sad? And she said, Daddy, I missed you while I was at school. I said, miss you? Oh, that's why she's sad. She's sad because I'm trying to prepare a meal. I'm trying to do all this stuff. I'm working, working, working for her, but I'm not being with her. I'm distracted by trying to prepare everything, but I'm not actually with her. I was distracted by doing. And could it be that we too are distracted by doing? By working, 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 serving, 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 doing, 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 working hard. I think working hard and doing an excellent job in our work is important. But could it be that some of us have crossed that threshold of I need to do a good job to this has become my life? that my life consists of serving, 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 and working, working, working hard? Could it be that life, life has, has been all about growing your business or your organization, or the, the very focus and, and predominant theme of your life is just to raise your children and, and just to provide for the family or to study for the next test or to, for the next extracurricular activity. Now, come on, I don't want to see a raise of hands, but how many of us are carrying uh, work problems or things that need to be taken care of or maybe tests or school items right now while we're here? Like, we're burdened about all of this work that we have to do that we're going to have to do next week. And could it be that we're distracted by doing, doing, doing? Could it be that, that, that we are so distracted by results that our relationships around us are crumbling? Could it be that we have, we have, we have, we have uh, prioritized productivity over presence? That's Martha's problem. Martha's problem is she is prizing productivity over presence because she's in the presence of Jesus, but she can't, who, she's thinking, how can I serve? Serve, 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 serve. And she's anxious, and look what Jesus says in verse 41. The text says, but the Lord answered, Martha, Martha. Look, when, when your parent says your name twice, you know, you gotta, you gotta pay attention, right? In Luke 22, verse 31, Jesus talked to Peter and said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you. He actually came to me and asked for permission to bother you. So when Jesus says your name twice, you got to pay attention here. Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. You are anxious. You guys ever felt anxious recently? In 2005, <clears throat> I was speaking with some students in Zimbabwe and Africa. I was in Pastor, Glenn, Doc, Pastor Russell's hotel room and, and, and other students were there trying to prepare our sermons for that day. And as I was preparing the sermon, I was an anxious soul. Oh, guys, am I, am I gonna finish this on time? We, we, we only have 30 minutes left? I think I need like 45 minutes or an hour. Oh man, I just can't get this slide. This story doesn't work. What story should I use? I was so anxious, and I remember Pastor Russell sitting in that hotel room saying, Nestor, I, I appreciate, what, I appreciate you know, your work, but could you please calm down because it's making me anxious. <laughs> distracted by doing, distracted by doing. I was anxious about my performance. I was anxious about, about, what, about making sure that I prepared a good sermon. And for Martha, you know, she was anxious 
about her role as a woman. In Jewish culture, a woman's skill in hospitality was a badge of honor. And in the Filipino culture, it's true too. One of the most hospitable cultures that, that, that I've seen, maybe I'm biased because I, I, I grew up in a, an, in a Filipino home, but it's true. Hospitality in Jewish culture said that a woman's skill in hospitality was a badge of honor. Aha, so that's why Martha was anxious. You know why she was anxious? <clears throat> Martha was anxious because she was obsessed about her hospitality. Martha's hospitality was tied to her self-image. Her performance, her hospitality, her serving was tied to her self-image. That's why she's anxious. I wanna wear the badge of honor because I wanna be Mrs. Hospitality in the town. And so I need to make sure that I serve well and that I do, 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 do well with my time. Because then, then I will wear that badge of honor. Then I will be actually become a person of worth. Her self-worth is rooted in her performance. And she becomes anxious. And friends, we're anxious too. You know why? Because we root our self-image and self-worth in our doing. I've read this before. Catherine reminded me, hey, you read that quote sometime. But let me, let me, read, it. Let me read this again, because some of you might not have heard this. <clears throat> this is a statement, I think it was in Vanity Fair, I have the source if you want it, by Madonna. You guys know who Madonna is? Okay, queen of pop. <clears throat> I usually don't quote Madonna and when I, when I speak, but let me just share with you what she said. Madonna, Madonna said, I have an iron will, and all of my will has always been to conquer some horrible feeling of inadequacy. I push past one spell of it and discover myself as a special human being, and then I get to another stage, and I think I'm mediocre and, un, 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 and uninteresting again and again. She said, my drive in life is from this horrible fear of being mediocre, right? I wanna become something, <clears throat> but I'm not doing well, well enough. Again, and then she says, and that's always pushing me, pushing me. Now listen to these last two lines. She says, because even though I've become somebody, I still have to prove that I'm somebody. And then she says, my struggle has never ended and it probably never will. I want to become a somebody, and I'm aiming for a somebody, but the image of that somebody, I'm not that somebody, and because I keep failing over and over again, I have to recreate myself and be more risque now, and I have to become a somebody, and when I think I grabbed it, when I think I've grasped that somebody and I've become that somebody, I'm not that somebody. And Martha's like, I want to become that somebody by doing, 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 by wearing that badge of honor and be by being the most hospitable person in town. And as much as she's grasping for it, she's actually grasping for the wind. And for Madonna, she's saying, I'm never going to be somebody. I'm trying, but I'm never going to be that, that somebody. And it's true. We will never become that somebody as long as our identity and self-worth is tied to what we do. You're never gonna reach that. You're never gonna reach that ideal. Let's, 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 let's apply this a little bit. <clears throat> what about uh, parents? I, I often think, what do I communicate? What do we communicate as parents to our children? Ah, oh, man, my kids, my kids aren't doing well, they're not behaving well enough. And if they were just behaved this way, then, then they would become a somebody. So, Let's do some behavior modification so that they can do well because obviously they're not behaving enough and they're not listening enough and they're having too many tantrums. And, and so we, we push this philosophy upon our children. And by the way, we're gonna learn more, learn more about that from Sheila Hines today at 2 p.m. Or what about spouses? Ah, oh, come on. I don't, I don't meet my spouse's standards. Like, he or she has this expectation, but I'm here. I don't, I don't need those standards. Or my spouse, my spouse doesn't, 
doesn't meet my standards. She needs to come up to here, or he needs to come up to here. Or work, you know what? I just re- I, I really need that promotion at work. Now, there's nothing wrong with working hard and being promoted and, and, and rising in your influence in, in, your, in your company or your organization. There's nothing wrong with that. But the question is, the question is, there's the, the, the question is what, what's the motivation behind it? Is it so that you can increase your influence and love others through your influence and through your skill? Or is it driven by a desire because you feel like you're not a somebody and finally when you climb up a few, few rungs on the ladder, you're finally gonna become a somebody? Or what about church? Come on, I, you know, I've, we've heard, I've heard this, right? Hey, 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 son, daughter, you haven't been to church in so long, you need to go to church more often because that's gonna save you, right? You just need to go and follow the rituals, because then you're gonna become a somebody. Martha thinks that she, beca- she can become a sub- somebody if she serves well. Come on, Jesus. I am serving. I'm wearing my badge of honor, and Martha is not serving with me. So go tell that lazy Martha, of, of the sister of mine, to serve with me, because that's what's most important. But you see, Jesus, when it comes to spending our time, Jesus has a different philosophy of how we spend our time. It's not this first option, doing. There's a second option. There's a second option. Second philosophy of how we should spend our time. Check out verse 42. The text says, let's start with 41 again. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. And then notice this in verse 42. You gotta see this. <clears throat> but one thing is, mine says necessary. What version does yours say, Jason? Needed. needed. I like the English standard version better. One thing is necessary. Like, one thing is necessary. I need water right now. That's necessary, right? This is needed right now for my throat. One thing is necessary. And then he says, Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. I love how Eugene Eugene Peterson translated this in his paraphrase, the the message. He said this, only one thing is essential. What word did I say? One thing is essential and Mary has chosen it. One thing is essential? Now, when I tell my children that veggies, that vegetables are essential, all right? It's essential, like when my great-grandmother told me, you better eat this slimy okra, it's essential, right? My great-grandmother said, this is necessary, right? When we say that something is essential, you need to do this, it's necessary. But when Jesus says that something is essential, it's really essential. It's really necessary, and the question is, What was that thing that Mary chose? Verse 39. I love this. And she, speaking about Martha, had a sister called Mary, and she did two verbs, two actions. She what? She sat where? I just imagine it. Maybe she... Do you think she, she, has, she was uh, sitting Indian style, cross, cross leg? I can imagine. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet. And what else did she do? Was she telling about her story? She was listening. Martha, 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 you're distracted by serving and you are anxious and troubled. But you know what? Mary has chosen the essential thing. And what's the essential thing? Doing, doing, doing? Serving, serving, serving? Nope. This is how she spent her time. Can you guys read that? Trying to write it big. Sorry about my handwriting. Mary 
chose the necessary thing with her time, which was to delight. And it's not just sitting, friends. It's not just sitting and passively taking it in. It's, it's actually delighting in him. Now, Mary's position, this is shocking. Why Mary on the floor? In their culture, a disciple of a rabbi would sit at the rabbi's feet. Mary's position is shocking because rabbis did not have women disciples. Girls did not even have formal education. They were trained in household duties like sewing and weaving and cooking and cleaning and doing and serving and hospitality. So this was radical for Mary to actually be sitting at Jesus' feet as a disciple. And Mary is sitting and listening and absorbing and delighting in Jesus. Martha, your philosophy of how you, you should, your, your, how you should use your time is serving, 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 and doing, doing, doing. But Mary has chosen the essential part, more essential than the slimy okra that you eat, or ampalaya, or whatever, peas. What, are, what, what, what vegetables do you like to eat? What is that? Guacamole, is that a vegetable? <laughs> avocado, avocado. All right? Even better than guacamole and avocado, right? Well, even better than doing is actually feasting on Christ and, taste, and tasting him. And that's what Mary did. And so question for you, you don't have to share with your neighbor. If you do a tom, time audit, okay? If you do a time audit, and review the last seven days of how you used your time, where would you rate yourself in these categories? Okay? How much of your time was consumed in doing, 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 doing? Or how much of our time has really been here? Oh, come on, Pastor. It's necessary that I make a living. It's necessary that I grow my business. It's necessary, it's necessary, it's necessary. Yeah, I mean, okay, I, it is necessary, but according to Jesus, what's necessary? Delighting and sitting and listening and receiving, and praying, and reading the word, and absorbing, and not just reading a devotional book, or great commentary about scripture, but actually going to scripture, and, and taking Jesus in, and asking, and delighting in him, and finding my greatest joy, and satisfaction, and pleasure, in receiving, and absorbing Jesus. And according to Jesus, that's necessary. That's essential. You see, Mary is not a somebody because of her hospitality. She's actually a nobody who became a somebody because she was in the presence of the true somebody. That's where she found her identity. Mary's identity was not wrapped up in her doing. It wasn't something that she achieved. Her identity and self-worth and her pleasure and happiness was something that she received. It wasn't what she achieved. It was receiving Christ, receiving the joy of Jesus. Her self-worth and her joy was not found in her service and her in, in trying to gain her gain something. Her self-worth and her joy and her happiness was given to her by Christ. Not achieved, but received. Not given, not gained, but given to her as a gift from Christ. That's where her true happiness was from. That's how she knew that she was a somebody. And before we serve, friends, I wonder, before we serve, and we're doing amazing things. Last week, we celebrated all of our medical workers. This week, we're blessing our, our neighbors and blessing those who are less privileged. And I wonder, I wonder to, to myself, and I wonder for this community of faith, could it be that God, is, that God is saying, hey, hey, make sure that before you serve and when you serve, that you're learning to sit first. 
That before you do something for Christ, oh yeah, here Jesus, I think you need a pumpkin and you need some corn. Like before we bring something, that we learn how to actually sit there and savor him. And to say silent. And to listen. To allow his words these eternal words to come into my life so that it soaks me so that I'm not just doing church for the sake of church, but I'm soaked by scripture and I can't wait to go to church. I can't wait to serve. I can't wait to tell people about Jesus because I've been soaking and bathing in the delightful sun rays of Jesus. And there's so much more. There's so much more. Martha, Martha, Martha. There's so much more. Martha, Mary has chosen the better part, the essential part, the necessary part. And friend, if you and I do a time audit, how much of us have been here? I'm not just talking about doing and serving. How much has have been here? Like when my daughter came to me and said, hey, you're doing this, dad, you're, you're doing all this stuff. I just wanna be with you. I just wanna be with you, Dad. That's what she was communicating. And so look, three applications then we're done. Three ways to apply this philosophy to our lives. One, delight before doing. Okay, I'm gonna put it right here. Delight, um, sorry, my handwriting, I know. You guys read that? So before I do and get up for work, I'm delighting in him. And you know what's so amazing about this? After Jesus talks about the uh, 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 one thing is necessary, Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her, the very next thing that he does, the, the, the Bible says in Luke chapter 11 verse one, now Jesus was praying in a certain place and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Are you serious? So Jesus is sharing something that he models. And he's, he's sharing, look, we're gonna do great ministry, but Mary has chosen the best thing, and I'm gonna model it in the next verse. And Jesus was actually praying to his father and talking to him. So what does that look like? That we delight in Christ before we do. That we, we quit Netflix earlier, go to sleep earlier, so we can wake up earlier, and before checking Facebook, we actually see the face of Jesus. And we delight in him. And so that we're taking that delight before we do. And, you know, different people have different methods, right? I'm not trying to glorify my method. I bought this weekly calendar, right? This weekly calendar, planning your week out. I'm such a productivity nerd, I know. But... Um, I have the list of all of my intentions. Do I get all of it done? No, most of it I do. But here's my top three. And you know what my most important intention is for the week? To commune with God and journal. And to speak to Jesus. And even though I, I don't complete all my tasks, I know that I've done the most necessary thing, the most essential, which is the delight. And to sit and to pray. So, application one, you delight before doing. Pray before productivity. Worship before you go to work, okay? Secondly, check this out. So, you delight, the word here is while, okay? So you delight while you do. Now, let me share this with you, and this is a, this is a little deep, but I think it'll make sense. Genesis chapter one, we're not gonna read all the verses. Jesus begins creation, right? So verse three, God said, let there be light, and God said that the light was good. What word? Good. And then, you know, he, he creates other things, and then in verse nine, God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered into one place, let the dry land appear, and it was so God called the dry land earth, and the waters there were gathered together. He called the seas, right, sea and land, and God saw that it was good, right? Um, God said in verse 11, let the earth sprout vegetation, plant yielding seed, and he finished his work, and then at the end of verse 12, the text says, and God saw that it was 
Good. God creates, it's good. God creates something, it's good. And then after he creates uh, mankind at the very end of chapter one, verse 31, the last verse, and God saw everything that he created and that he made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. A lot of us think that we cannot, we separate delight from doing, from worship, from work. But while God was creating, he was delighting in his creation. And so I wonder, you know the euphoria you feel when you create something? Those of you in the medical field, surgeons, you, 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 you uh, perform a successful surgery. There's a sense of satisfaction. Ooh, this was good. Nurses, I don't know what example. Wow, what a successful injection. I don't, I don't know. Wow, great. I don't know why I thought of that. Teachers, this lesson plan, that was good. Oh, the conversation of that student who came to me who needed help, and finally, light, light bulb went on in his, in his eye, light bulb in his mind. I could see it in his eyes that, that, that there was a teaching moment. Ooh, the euphoria, that's good. Or you're a carpenter, you work with your hands. Ooh, that's good. That euphoria and the feeling you have of satisfaction from creating, could it be that comes because you and I were made in the image of God, that we are co-creators with God? And that when we create something in the euphoria that I feel when I create a song and I sit here on Tuesdays or Thursdays whenever I'm at the church and I create a song, that euphoria that I feel like, ooh, this is good, is actually because I am made in God's image and that I can, I can that, that euphoria and the joy that I feel in doing something, I can delight in and that I can actually bring worship and delight and bring that back and say, God, thank you for that successful injection or thank you, God, for the possibility of creating, uh, cr- creating this, this arrangement on music or create, creating this lesson plan. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring delight into our doing. And we're trying to take the, the worship that we had and bring it not just before, oh, I just prayed before my surgery or I prayed this morning, but I'm actually trying to think that all of my serving and all of my doing is all encompassing and that I can delight in God in the things that I create and give him glory and praise for everything that I do. Thank God for the, this successful investment. Thank you, Lord, for this product that's selling like hotcakes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I don't know about you, but we separate these two spheres thinking that they're separate, but they're all together. And if we're creating, and if God is with us, that I can glorify God in the amazing conversations that I have with someone over, over uh, at Starbucks. I can bring God into every conversation, and every time I have joy, I can say yes. Praise God for that. That I can bring the delight of God into my doing. So we delight before we work, we delight while we are working, and last but not least, <clears throat> we delight in Christ's doing. Now check this out. Um, I look at my task list, I'm probably not going to finish everything I wrote down this, this past Monday. I'm not. And let's be honest, how many of us, um, how many of us have tasks from that, you know, from last week? that are going to carry over into next week. Anyone? Or is it just me? (laughs) Yeah. We're going to carry that into next week. Okay? And for some people, that causes a lot of anxiety. Okay? So what do we do? What do we do with attention? What if I don't finish all the work on my list? Let me give you just one more passage, and then we're through. What if I don't complete my work? John chapter 19, this is Jesus, his last words, uh, verse 28. Notice what he says. Notice what the Bible says. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. Now catch verse 30. Don't, Don't miss this. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said the last three words, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. 
So what do you do when you're anxious about not completing all the tasks that you were supposed to, supposed to finish? What do you do with the goals that you didn't accomplish this year? We're almost done with 2022. You had New Year's resolutions that you didn't fulfill this year. What do we do with that? What's really important, friends, is not that you completed your work, but what's really important in the grand scheme of things is that Jesus completed his work. Meaning that I rest in what Jesus has done. That's where I found my satisfaction. And if I'm like Mary, oh man, I'm just not serving enough. There's not enough food on the table. The house is not clean. I'm stressed out. Now, these things are important, right? You need to have a clean house and prepare meals. That's, that's important. But if our philosophy of life is here, then we're never gonna be, we're never gonna be happy. But when I, when I think about Jesus and the fact that he finished his work, it is finished. That he accomplished salvation. That's my source of delight. And when I sit at his feet and worship, I'm not just reading a devotional book. I'm actually glorying in savoring the work that Jesus has done on my behalf of dying and saving me and working in my life. And so many of us are worried about our time. We're worried about our time. But check this out, guys. What's 72, what's 73 years compared to forever? Seriously. I mean, you know the story, the grand narrative of, of the, meta, the meta story, right? Eric and I talk, always use that word. We were created, right? What's the second, second chapter of the Christian story? There was the fall, and then what's the third part? There was redemption that Jesus completed his work. And then there's going to be a new creation. We were created to dwell with Christ forever, but because we chose our own way, Adam and Eve chose their own way, we've sinned and we've fallen short. But Jesus Christ came and he finished the work of purchasing our salvation, of redeeming us. He was so generous. And Jesus was so generous that he says, look, if you trust in me and believe in me, that I'm going to turn you and make you into a new creation so that you can live with me forever. So you don't have to worry about and stress about just the 73 years of life that you have on planet Earth. You're actually going to have me for the rest of your life. You're going to have me forever. And 20 years ago in Prosser High School, when I heard the gospel and I heard about Christ, this kid, this city kid, skinniest Filipino kid in the city of Chicago was busy doing, 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 and, and not doing, doing, not doing, and not doing, and not doing. I didn't know what the purpose of my life was, but when I found out that Christ completed salvation for me, I delighted in that. It did something in my heart. And now all the time that I wasted, now I see it in the, pers in, the, in the perspective of Jesus' eyes, that Jesus even took the time that I wasted and redeemed all of that wasted time and uses that time for his glory. And friends, I would say this, that if our lives are just focused here, we're going to miss out on the amazing blessing of the light. And my challenge to you and to me, to all of us today, it's not, ah, yeah, buy the next planner or buy the next self-help book, strategy to manage your time. Those are good. But follow Christ's philosophy, prioritizing, delighting in him over doing, sitting and savoring over serving, worshiping over work. And the more we identify here, the more we realize that we are a somebody because Jesus is that somebody that we trust. So as our praise team comes up, I wonder if someone has been touched by this message. And in your heart of hearts, you're saying, you know what? I've been trusting in myself and my doing rather than trusting in what Jesus has done in his doing. My source of happiness has been myself, but now I wanna place the object of my happiness on the right object, which is Christ and what he's done for me. And if you're sensing that in your heart, friend, 
we want to walk alongside you in your journey. There's a connect card in the pew in front of you. We're even going to put the QR code on the screen. Those of you watching online, if you're saying, look, I want to begin a relationship with Christ, mark that on the connect card or on the website, our online connect card. Mark baptism if you're thinking about baptism. Look, I want to be part of a Bible study group. Mark that too. If you have a question or comment, write that too. Write your name, your best contact, and the pastoral team will come alongside you in your journey with Jesus. Friend, now is the time of salvation. Now is the time to taste, taste and see that Jesus is good. So fill that connect card, and as our deacons collect our tithe and offering as we, collect, as we uh, sing this closing song, you can slip that connect card in the, the offering plate. So let's stand together. Let's give glory to God. Let's give glory to God for His goodness and what He's done for us.